Hey, my name's Tom Smith. In my position, I'm a wildlife ecologist, a professor at Brigham Young University. I teach uh, courses in wildlife biology. Um, well, the research on polar bears in Alaska really began in earnest in the, in the early 80s. And at that time, uh, Dr. Amstrup with the USGS Alaska Science Center put out radio collars. They didn't know much of anything about these animals. Over the years, and certainly in the period of the early 80s to early 90s, about 50% of the females that became pregnant that dug and created maternal dens, 50% were out on the sea ice, 50% were on the land. From that time till now, we now see a major shift away from the sea ice. So the bears are abandoning the ice habitat and coming onto the land because the sea ice is, is too thin for them to feel comfortable or confident that that's going to hold up for months. So in a very real sense, climate change, diminishment of the ice uh, thickness and extent is having a, an impact on these animals. This unfortunately happens at the same time that we have a, an increasing global need for oil. So now areas that were formerly kind of worked over and it looked like Prudhoe Bay, for instance, was going to be decommissioned in the early 2000s. Well, now we have new technology, uh, higher prices, greater demand, and so that's now reinfused a tremendous amount of exploration and uh, development activity in those very places. So the stage is kind of set for an overlap of bears moving off of diminishing ice and humans moving back into that zone with more development than ever. So it's very important that uh, we get a handle on where these bears are going. That's one very real sort of um, effect of a changing climate. Another one is that we have uh, monitored the condition and weight of bears in the um, southern Beaufort Sea for about 25 years and that is in a very marked decline. That's just a, a, a very strong metric. You can see bears are getting lighter and less he he uh, healthy. We also have uh, cub, cub litter size is going down. This last year uh, we had a, a triplet litter, triplet litter with uh, a cub that died and we it was one of the dens I was studying so we caught all that on camera it's kind of tough mm -hmm. see a little thing can barely walk and then the mother's carrying it out in her teeth and letting it play outside and then taking it in and finally the other cubs come out and then she brings it out dead you know so these kinds of things then now triplets are often die but but we're seeing uh, those kinds of things happen we've also seen predation events which up until 2004 hadn't really been documented across the, the Canadian Arctic or American Arctic. And we had four of those in one year where bears killed bears, not uh, just because of a, a dominance uh, kind of struggle. This was for food. And that's something that between 75 years of uh, polar bear experience among uh, the scientists I work with, nobody had ever seen that and it hadn't been documented. These are all things that one would expect from an increasingly stressed population. So lots of little and, you know, lines of evidence that support the notion that the population's undergoing stress. Well, of course, the listing was symbolic in some people's minds because of the fact that you pointed out it's uh, we're talking uh, hundreds of thousands of square miles of potential habitat. We're talking the source of the problem is uh, CO2 generated globally and pollutants that are generated globally. But the listing was important. The Endangered Species Act in the United States uh, states clearly that under certain circumstances, the species should be listed and we should make it a priority to recover those species. And if this is just one more reason to get on with uh, climate change initiatives that will help us to get uh, control of our CO2 output, then so be it. That's a good thing. So I think nobody doubts that it's a good thing uh, in terms of helping us focus on uh, what we need to do in order to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, carbon dioxide output primarily. Well, you know, as an American, America's uh, policies have taken a, an increased tempo with the new administration, and we're all rooting for that. Um, in listening to my Canadian colleagues, I'm not tapped into Canadian politics, but they're, they're fairly disappointed in the slow pace with which the Canadian uh, government's responding to a clearly perceived threat to not just polar bears, but the, the entire 
uh, ecosystem that comprises the country. So although polar bears are, again, the kind of an icon of climate change, the fact that uh, little is being done that, that pleases these people and many others is, uh, I guess I'd have to vote uh, along their lines then. I'll, I'll, I'll trust them because they're, they're astute in their political um, information and, and I think they must know. I don't personally know much about the Canadian government, but, but I do know they're not listed mm -hmm. and they're still hunting them. Yeah. And so that does say something right there that uh, apparently they're not being too proactive Um, yes, I just started to do the uh, research on den denning, and I'll never forget. I was uh, the, the 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 problem you have in the Arctic is depth perception doesn't work for you anymore. So uh, we kind of tend to forget that in woodland areas, or because you see trees and it, the trees make everything else snap into the proper frame. But in the Arctic, you, you look around and there's nothing there. So what you think is a bluff that's a quarter mile away, it's four miles away and those kind of things. And so uh, I had zeroed in on what I knew to be a den because it was radio track. I, we'd radio tracked it there. And uh, to my delight, this bear came out of, the, out of this hole. And I remember its head coming out. And it was uh, first uh, revelation was it was quite yellow. It wasn't polar white at all. It was uh, yellow, like a lemon. And you'll see images of bears that look quite yellow, so this is quite yellow. And, but the thing that was amazing was it came up and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought it couldn't get any bigger and it got bigger. And I was just like, my jaw dropped. I go, my gosh, that thing is so huge. And, um, you know, I was probably about 100 meters from it standing out on the snow. I wasn't in a tundra buggy and I wasn't in a vehicle. So, and I'm not, I work with bears a lot, so I wasn't afraid of it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but it was just huge. And uh, since then, I've come back to many of these dens, and you'll get a four to five hundred pound female through a hole that I have to take my coat off to get in, and I'm not that big, I, you know. So they're quite good at disarticulate, you know, their shoulders and going up through very, very tight spots. But that was the first time; it was just a, a real jaw-dropping kind of. It. The color's wrong, the size is too big, <laughs> but there it was, and you couldn't argue with reality. So it was quite a good experience.